Hello, welcome to the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Kat Murthy. I'm the digital marketing manager here at Cato, and you are at our new media lunch, a regular series highlighting the intersection between tech, social media, and liberty. Our panelists here today will be discussing the policy and privacy concerns surrounding filming active duty police officers, as well as touching upon uh, on-body camera programs and what those could potentially do to mitigate the problems of police misconduct. Um, for those of you in our online audience and watching on C-SPAN today, our hashtag is New Media Lunch. If you would like to tweet in questions. Otherwise, for those of you in the audience, we will be taking them at the end of the panel. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker here today, Steve Silverman. Steve is the founder and executive director of the Flex Your Rights organization, and he's also a Cato internship alum. He's the creator of the immensely popular educational movies, Busted, The Citizen's Guide to Surviving Police Encounters, and more recently, 10 Rules for Dealing with Police. In addition to self-distributing more than 35,000 DVDs, the Flex Your Rights YouTube channel has seen over 35 million views. Steve? Thank you, Kat, and I appreciate it. How many of you have seen the movie The Matrix by a show of hands? OK, pretty much everybody. Good. So what I want to try to do is, is the same thing with you um, that happened to Neo. Do you remember when he said, I know Kung Fu, after they uploaded the Kung Fu program into his brain? Well, like I said, I want to try to do the same thing with you. But what I want is for you to say, I know how to record the police. So to do this, I've broken down this into flex your rights, five rules for recording the police. Rule number one, know the law. And the law is you have the right to openly record the police in public. You'll notice that I emphasized openly, and I'll explain why in a second. This first rule is probably the most important, but it's also the most confusing of the rules because we've all seen um, videos where uh, people are getting arrested for openly recording the police in public. And we see these you know, every day uh, of police intimidating people or even arresting people who, who do nothing more than film the police. And this is happening despite the fact that every state and federal circuit court to rule on this question has concluded that filming the police in public is First Amendment protected activity. But some of you might ask, well, what about the 12 or so states that have what are called all party consent laws that require all parties to agree to be recorded? Well, we have good news here because the courts in these states have ruled that those laws do not apply to citizens who are openly recording the police in public. So, the most obvious and effective way to avoid running afoul of these all-party consent laws uh, is to use your camera like you are a reporter, not like you're a spy. So you want to be always openly recording. Some of you who know a little bit about these laws might be saying, well, wait a second. What about Massachusetts and Illinois? These are two states that have statutes on their book that make it illegal to report the police, record the police in public. Again, there's good news here. Because in 2011, the First Circuit Court of Appeals covering Massachusetts declared their law to be unconstitutional. Soon afterwards, in 2012, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals covering Illinois did the exact same thing. So those laws have been invalidated. Therefore, in the United States, citizens always have the right to openly record the police in public. So if you're recording the police and police tell you to put your camera away, that is an unlawful order. And so in this situation, I would argue that it is OK to inform the police of your law by saying something like, officer, I'm familiar with the law, but the courts have ruled that it doesn't apply to recording on duty police. I generally don't advise. Um, in favor of educating the police about the law and other sorts of <laughs> encounters. They generally do not appreciate that. But in this situation, I think it is advisable. Rule number two, know your technology. How many of you have a, a smartphone on you right now by a show of smartphones? I think that's pretty much, pretty much most everybody here, and that is great. Um, now, how many of you who have a smartphone 
passcode protect your phone? Or actually, most of you, well, who of you uh, here does not passcode protect your phone? You shouldn't admit to that. No, it's OK. <laughs> um, but you can easily secure it by uh, installing a passcode protection. I highly recommend it. The Supreme Court recently uh, passed a very excellent ruling requiring uh, police to uh, obtain a warrant before searching your smartphone. But in the meantime, it's always a good idea to keep it locked down um, because sometimes police uh, don't get the memo right away. Um, now, how many of you have a streaming video recording app on the home screen of your smartphone? Really? We got like three, four, five? That's fantastic. Now, um, for those of you who don't have this, let me, I'm going to show you right now the benefits of keeping a streaming video app on your home screen. Right now, I'm unlocking my secret passcode. I am tapping the Bamboozer streaming video recording app. I don't, I don't work from Bamboozer, um, but right now they have the best streaming video recording app out there, and I'm now streaming you all live. Mm to an off-site server. Now, the benefit of this for when you are recording the police is that if a police officer unlawfully tries to snatch, confiscate, or destroy your smartphone, what you have recorded up until that moment will be saved securely off-site. Also, if you use Bamboozer or another live streaming video uh, recording app, Bamboozer in particular has a neat feature where if you tap the sleep button, what happens is your screen goes blank. And this can be add additional security and protection for your, for your data because um, the uh, uh, passcode, it goes to sleep. But if they try to unlock it, if they turn it on, they're going to get a passcode. And of course, you're not going to give them your passcode. And they're not going to be able to get into and delete your recordings, which is an extra layer of protection. Rule number three, respond to things cops say. C-SPAN is here, so I'll just keep it as things cops say. Um, for example, cops might say, if you are, for example, recording um, an arrest that's happening, you're a witness, um, suddenly you might see a situation where one of the police officers will break off from that and will suddenly approach you and say, hey, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Well, sometimes people make the mistake of responding with something like, uh, officer, I'm, I'm recording you to make sure you're doing your job right. Or I'm recording you because I don't trust the police. <laughs> There's a better way to say this. I think um, a better way to approach this less confrontationally is to say something like, officer, I'm not interfering. I'm asserting my First Amendment right to record. You're being documented and recorded off-site. That's why it's a good idea to use a live streaming video uh, recorder. Another thing that cops might say is, hey, please stop recording me. That is against the law. And police who uh, are in you know, those 12 states with all party consent laws might actually use this misunderstanding of the law uh, in order to try to get you to, to stop recording. And in this situation, again, I think it's OK to say something like, officer, I'm familiar with the law, but the courts have ruled that the law doesn't apply to recording on-duty police. Another thing, officers might scream at you and say, hey, stand back. Get back. You're interfering. I need you to step back. A good response to this is to, is to step back. I think it's OK to, to be a little bit flexible in this situation. Say something like, officer, I'm not interfering. I'm asserting my First Amendment right to record. It's for my safety and for yours. Rule number four, do not point your camera at the police like it's a gun like this. I've seen lots of videos where people kind of get aggressive and they shove it in their face like this. I don't think it's a really good idea. I think a better way to do it, and also you can avoid that vertical video syndrome that you might see in some videos that people post online where you see the black borders and it's really ugly and it looks like you're looking at the video through like a, a crack in a door. Make sure you go horizontal. And I think it's a good idea to record like this. When you hold the phone at waist level, I think it's a lot less confrontational pose. And you can still look at the screen and get a perfectly good shot. You don't have to frame it up like a cinematographer. It's OK if you clip the officer's head in the process. But it's better than pointing your camera like a gun. And you can avoid that, that vertical video. Rule number five, final rule. Prepare to be arrested. 
I've been telling you the whole time, basically, how this is perfectly legal behavior. And yet, if you are brave enough to record the police, you must look at this activity as a potential act of civil disobedience that can lead to your arrest. Now, it's troubling that citizens who are not breaking the law should prepare to be arrested. But if the officer says, shut it off or I will arrest you, you should take the officer at his or her word. At this point, it's entirely up to you if you want to continue testing the boundaries of free speech and risk arrest. You may comply by saying something like, officer, OK, I'm turning the camera off, but under protest. Or if you keep recording, brace yourself for arrest. If you're recording with bamboozer, for example, hit the sleep button to prevent police from deleting your footage that is now stored off site. Do not physically resist. And as with any arrest, you have the right to remain silent until you speak with a lawyer. You should use this right by shutting up. Keep calm and be confident that any frivolous charges against you will almost certainly be dropped and you will have preserved video evidence of an illegal arrest that might become the basis of a potentially lucrative lawsuit. But more importantly than that, your brave stand could help change the way police treat other citizens who assert their First Amendment right to record police. So congratulations, you've all been upgraded. You now know how to record the police. Okay, thank you, Steve. Our uh, next... Our next presenter here today is Jonathan Blanks. Jonathan is a research associate for, in Cato Center for Constitutional Studies, and he's also a blog editor with Cato at Liberty, Cato's online blog. His research interests include police misconduct, the drug war, overcriminalization, and other criminal justice issues. His work has been published in online outlets like Rare.us and Reason.com, as well as print and online editions of the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and Denver Post. He also maintains a personal blog, Blank State, Blank Slate, and you can follow him on Twitter at, at Blank Slate. Thank you, Kat. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for uh, Tim Lynch, who was originally scheduled to be here, but he fell ill, but I am so happy to be here in his stead because this is something I'm very uh, passionate about. Uh, PoliceMisconduct.net is a Cato resource that we use to disseminate the many instances of police abuse and crime uh, throughout the country. Uh, I should also take this moment to thank Katie Ranville, who does so much work behind the scenes of keeping this uh, site up and running and up to date. Um, the website is not meant to shame police as a whole or be anti-cop in any real way. We believe that police officers are trying to do their best, but that the incentives and institutional pressures for rule breaking uh, are, are existent and that this too often leads to rights violations uh, against both the guilty and the innocent. Uh, we show how often this occurs with daily roundups of the latest news around the country of police breaking the laws. Uh, police misconduct tends to be thought of as this sort of rare, like bad apples sort of incident where it's just one cop and it's not representative of the entire department. And that's often very true. Uh, you know, it only does take one cop to give the rest of the cops a bad example. Uh, however, there are many factors that uh, shield and protect bad cops, including the complicity of good cops. Uh, who, though they may resent the bad ones, feel uh, through police solidarity that they need to stay quiet or support him. But that's, for, that's kind of a long story for a Q&A or at some other time. Um, but because of this reputational imbalance between police and an accused defendant, misconduct often goes unnoticed or unreported. Moreover, when officers are caught doing bad things, such incidents are often dismissed out of hand again as this sort of bad apples situation. Uh, but we feel that Police misconduct is something that requires more attention because, as Justice Brandeis said, uh, sunlight is the best in disinfectant. It, the more we know about police misconduct, we, the better we know how to deal with bad apples and the better that we can uh, stop bad management of police agencies. And technology is a growing part of, uh, this, uh, of maintaining that accountability from both a, an internal police perspective and from forced accountability uh, by the citizens, as uh, Steve described. Um, then there is reason to be optimistic about the future of policing due to the advances in recording technology. As Steve explained, so many, we all, most all of us have cell phones with recording technology, and this, they're virtually ubiquitous. Um, likewise, dash cams uh, have been standard in patrol cars for a very long time, and now the technology allows uh, police officers to wear cameras on their person, so they can now record every instance that they come into contact with the public. 
These technologies, of course, allow for neutral observers to observe contested events and stops after the fact. And so this sometimes, obviously, police can be shown to have abused their authority, and this can exonerate an innocent person. But it also works to protect the police. Uh, just recently, uh, an officer was accused of sexual assault from someone that he stopped. And his, uh, his camera showed that he did absolutely nothing wrong, and it exonerated him. Because affordable and accessible technology might have Affordable and accessible technology may have finally brought us closer to finally answering the question, who watches the watchers? We all do. Uh, as many of you probably know, um, the official autopsy results of the Michael Brown case in Ferguson, Missouri released yesterday along with leaked grand jury evidence. Uh, if Officer Wilson was wearing a body camera, perhaps we would have a better idea of what actually transpired between his in uh, instruction for Brown and his friend to leave the street and then the altercation that eventually led to Michael Brown's death. I say perhaps because we know technology is only as good as the people who use it and share it. Cameras are not a cure-all. There are instances caught on film in which police are clearly violating the rights of others, but they That's escape right. prosecution, punishment, or conviction. Two years ago, there was a young man in Prince George's County, Maryland, just outside of DC, who was assaulted by a police officer. The man's crime was essentially walking away from a police officer who wanted his attention the police officer started running after him, and he turns around hearing the, the, the running footsteps. The, cop, the police officer is not yelling, stop police or anything. He turns around to see who's running after him, and he gets hit in the face with a gun. The gun goes off. No, luckily, no one is shot, but this man, again, was assaulted by a police officer. Luckily, there was surveillance footage of this because the man was charged, essentially, was charged and spent a, ma uh, a month in jail for essentially being physically assaulted by a police officer. Now, the, the, uh, the police officer was charged. He did go to trial, but he won. There was, there was video evidence, and it, it didn't get him off. He also was not fired from the police department. He, he had back issues, and he was allowed to retire, which usually means a pension. Um, the, and likewise, as Radley Balco has noted, uh, video evidence is sometimes withheld from by police departments. Uh, one instance that he, he uh, that he noted was uh, a woman was pulled over by the police, and uh, she claims that she was injured during that stop. Uh, backup police came. There were seven dash cams, all mysteriously simultaneously stopped working, <laughs> and so it was her. It's her word against the seven police officers. Guess what happened? People's word against the police are, in court are usually not good without video evidence. And part of this is because people want to believe police officers, and I understand that impulse, but they are people just like the rest of us. People lie, and they have many incentives to lie. And this is where the public comes in. As Steve was saying, that if you follow the right rules, you follow his rules, you can get taped evidence of misconduct in your own, in your own neighborhoods. But I must caution that this still is a dangerous endeavor. Uh, I think some of you probably saw during the protest in Ferguson, uh, there was a, a, a large sort of moving protest. And a uh, police officer was in the middle of it, frightened and scared. And he pointed his assault weapon at, at individuals. And he threatened to kill one of them. And uh, this was caught on tape. And the videographer asked him, he was like, did you just threaten to kill me? What's your name? The officer officer responded with something I'm not going to say on C-SPAN, but that became his nickname and became, you know, it went viral. Um, he, because of that video, that officer was found, he was identified, and he was fired. That is very rare. If that police officer got too scared or someone bumped into him or something went wrong, that person with the video camera could have been shot. So please be very careful. I'm not saying don't do it. Please do but just understand the risks and be as careful as you possibly can. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jonathan. And then our final panelist here today is uh, Matthew Fogg. Matthew is a retired chief deputy of the U.S. Federal Marshal, uh, Marshal Service and a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He received the District of Columbia U.S. Attorney and Federal Bar Association's highest law enforcement awards for tracking down over 300 of America's most wanted and dangerous uh, fugitives. And after 32 years of service, Matthew retired following a final D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision 
finding USMS grossly violated his civil rights and was operating a racially hostile environment for African American deputy US Marshals nationwide. Matthew holds leadership positions in three nonprofit government watchdog organizations today. You can find him on Twitter at US Marshal 77. Matthew? Thank you very much. And it's good to be here. And thank you for the introduction, Kat. And I agree wholeheartedly with my two colleagues here, Steve and Jonathan, uh, things that have been presented here. But I present a law enforcement perspective that also, just to augment and add to that, some of the things that I've observed. And one of the things, as you heard when you said, that for me to win a lawsuit even against the Justice Department says that there were improprieties, a lot of things going on wrong on the inside. But one thing I always remembered when I came out of the academy and I arrived at my duty station here in Washington, D.C., I remember the manager told me, he says, Fogg, look, because I was this young recruit, all excited, had all of this training, point shoot, when to shoot, how to use the First and Fourth Amendment rights, how, what your rights were, how to uh, Im implement the law, so to speak, and was really excited about it. And the first thing he said to me was, Fogg, I know you guys learned all that stuff at the academy and all that. He says, listen, but this is how we do it here. And I always remember him saying that to you. This is how we do it here. And what I'm going to say to you about this is when we look at the body cameras and we say what types of um, solutions we can come up with to help us to maybe understand police better and maybe get a better understanding of the situation, we have to understand I'm, when I'm on that street as a law enforcement officer, I have a lot of discretion and I have a network behind me that's going to back me up. Sometimes we call it the good old boy network, whatever you want to call it. But it includes police officers, includes prosecutors, includes judges. It's a whole network. And even those when we hit the grand jury, I remember when I sat on the grand jury and I remember that close relationship that the U.S. attorneys had with the grand jurors, talking to them every day, communicating, laughing, joking together, coming together. So that right there had a major influence on those cases that they even brought before the grand jury, whether they're going to get indictments in that. What I'm saying to you is there's a network here that we're talking about. How do we build and how do we get into that network? Now, being a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP, LEAP is a powerful organization because we nationally, across the, across the whole country, we, we, we send the message out. The war on drugs is bad policy. But not only is it bad policy, and not only does it cost the country a lot of money, it's probably one of the most racist, racist policies that has been instituted since slavery. And that's pretty powerful. But when you begin to look at the disparities in the numbers from the ACLU reports, I was a member of Amnesty International. We did a racial profiling um, report that indicated more people have been profiled since 9-11 than the population of Canada. I mean, I've seen so many reports that shows the, the disparities aren't close. They're so widespread that when we look and we see what happened in, um, in Ferguson, when we see what happened in New York, the chokehold. We're seeing this stuff now right on television. We saw this man be choked to death while he was saying, I can't breathe, and he was ultimately killed. We saw Rodney King get beat, hit how many times with a stick? Watching this right on television, everybody's saying, that is awful. That is crazy. But what happens? The officers don't get convicted. Because what happens is that network behind you says, this is how we do it here. So what I'm trying to say is this. Yes, body cameras are good. But it really, we, we don't know, to be honest with you, when it gets, when all that information is gone back and when a, when a jury, when, it's, when you're sitting in front of a jury and that officer is allowed to go back and Rethink everything, because if you know the law is different when officers involved, they don't have to give a statement right away. There are all the protections that they have. And once they get back, people are telling them, I know, I've been involved in shootings. I know what they say. Look, you want to change this. You don't want to say this. You want to be careful how you put this forward. All of this is real, ladies and gentlemen. And what I'm saying to you is once that begins to happen, you take a year or two years for a trial to come up, that jury is sitting there and that jury is hearing the officer saying, oh, well, I believe I thought he had a gun and I was threat for my life. And I remember one of my partners was killed six months ago or so-and-so was killed. So I felt a threat when he turned around and he looked at me with his hands up saying, don't shoot. I still felt a threat. 
And you're going to get people that are going to sit on that jury and going to listen and say, you know what? I wasn't out there, and I know police officers have a lot that they got to go through every day. And so, therefore, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. What I'm simply saying here is there is a lot in law enforcement that is wrong, but we need protection. I dare say to you this. When I won my case, everybody said to me first, Fogg, don't take on the Justice Department. Don't go forward. You know what happens to cops when they blow the whistle and they speak out. Your career will be destroyed, and not only that, but they will probably kill you or set you up in a stake. And believe it or not, that happened. My backup actually left me in a stakeout. My black partner, in, uh, who also raised a discrimination complaint about the internal improprieties, wound up dead. Somebody ran his car off the road. They don't know who killed Bill Scott to this day. The, the white marshal that spoke up, he lost his job. He went to Congress and testified how they gave him a black rubber rat. He's holding that up before Congress. That's what they gave him in the squad bay. So what I'm saying to you is we've got these situations out here that we're looking at that are going on in Ferguson and down in uh, Sanford, uh, Florida. And, and, and mainly because, like I said, now it is an issue with the cameras and so forth. But this stuff has been going on, ladies and gentlemen, for ever. It has been out there, trust me. With my 32 years of law enforcement, I saw a lot of questionable incidents that I had to tell officers right then and there, you're not going to do that in front of me right here. When I'm working with other departments, because see, as U.S. Marshals, I would work with Seattle, Miami, LAPD, New York PD. And I'm going to tell you, I saw some of the most egregious violations of your rights. And let me tell you something. You pull a vehicle over and a young man says to him, tell that officer, uh, do I have some rights here? Uh, no, you can't search my car. Then they'll just bring a dog and the dog's nickname is Alert. <laughs> That's his nickname. He'll alert, he will alert on a deodorizer. What I'm saying to you is there are all kinds of ways to get around your First and your Fourth Amendment rights if that's what I want to do. And see, most African-Americans out there in the street, they know that, so they don't even want to challenge it a lot of times. Because if you get pulled over and you're on your way to work or you're on your way to going somewhere, you know right there that officer can put you in a situation where he can either create a problem for you, so you just give him consent. You don't want to be held up for work. You don't want to go through these changes. So you give them the consent and you say, go ahead. Now, it's easy to stand back and say, no, I don't want you to search my vehicle or all of the other rights that you have. But there are so many other things that come into play out there on that street. And what I'm saying is until we start to address those issues, until we start to really say to people, why are these disparities when we look at the same drug, crack cocaine, arrest or, uh, uh, and we look at the same, the same arrest, the same incidents, but we see the numbers of, <clears throat> excuse me, the numbers of African Americans that are arrested, charged, and doing time for the same drug. I've always said, if the war on drugs was an equal opportunity enforcement operation, we wouldn't even be having the war on drugs issue today, because it would have been over the same way as alcohol prohibition. But because it's not equal, like that manager told me when I was working for DEA, he said to me, I said, look, we got all of our drug and gun interdiction task forces in all the urban areas, Miami, Seattle, Washington, but they were all urban areas we were focusing on. I said, don't they use drugs in Potomac, Maryland? Don't they use them in Silver Spring or other maybe more affluent locations? He says, yes, Fog. Matter of fact, they use them probably more. They got the better stuff. He says, but if we go out there and start to lock those folks up, throw flashbangs in their homes, run through their houses, do all of the things that we do in our enforcement operations, you know what happened? We will get a phone call and they will shut our operation down. And there goes your overtime. There goes all your excitement, all your money and everything you're making. So you know what he said? They still using the drugs. Let's just go to the weakest link and get our numbers up. And I told him that's ethnic cleansing. But this is what we have to look at. We have to understand this whole process and how it's working. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so from what all of the panelists, all of you guys were saying here today, it sort of sounds as if uh, cameras would be a part of a solution. Do th are they actually a viable solution for police misconduct? Do they need to be part of an overall strategy? Um, 
are they maybe not going to work? I mean, I, I think that uh, certainly, as, as I think Matt kind of pointed out so well, you, you can't count on cameras to cure the problem. But I think, you know, what what cam what video does is it brings us uh, it brings us closer to the truth, and the truth can bring us closer um, to justice and accountability. Um, I think that I, I like the fact that you have politicians like Rand Paul and Claire McCaskill in the wake of Ferguson are now talking about funding for uh, cameras, body cameras for the police, because I think what we've, what we've seen in, in sort of small trials um, that have been done where uh, I think it was Rialto, California, I mean, it was, it was a trial that was funded, I think, by like Taser Incorporated. And so you sort of have to take it with a grain of salt, I think, but they, in that small study they found after a year, the incidence of police actually using um, force reduced by about 80%, like really striking reduction. And the uh, incident of police misconduct reports was reduced by about 60%. So I think what, what you're seeing is just, what I hope to see more often is the police officer with the body camera facing off against the citizen carrying a camera. <laughs> and what you're gonna have there is a very pleasant and lawful police encounter, I think more times than not. And that's a good thing because video brings us the truth, which brings us closer to justice. No, I, I, I agree with pretty much everything. Well, not pretty much. I agree with everything Steve said. Um, there are cultural problems within police departments. Um, the thing called the thin blue line, uh, where cops will not testify against each other for the reasons right. that, that Matt said. It, it's really, it, when you read the stories, I mean, it, it, you think of it, when you think of corruption, you, you think, okay, well, you know, his wife left him, he, so he's taking a little bit of money on the side, it's not that big a deal, you know, he's, no, no one's dying. But the problem is I've read cases where they are not, they, police officers are afraid to tell on child molesters. I mean, the, the, the intimidation factor within the police culture can be so bad that they will, they will protect whomever just to keep the peace. Um, that requires uh, considerable uh, reorganization of police departments and accountability. Uh, a lot of people point at the, the policemen's union, as you see with uh, the Ferguson case. Uh, the, the pages that went up to fundraise for Officer Wilson were, in fact, run by the uh, police unions. I, I don't blame them as the only, the only factor, I think, because there are plenty of just the institutional problems that are completely divorced from the union that reinforce this uh, CYA uh, procedures. And just, just to add a little bit to that, yes, the ba I think the body cameras is a good it's, it's a good idea. I mean, certainly me as a law enforcement officer being on the street, I mean, I would have felt a little funny. Everything that I'm doing is being recorded. Uh, that there is a certain invasion of your sort of your rights or just you being a normal person. But because there is so much uh, violence when it comes down to, especially again, the African-American community we're talking about. See, we're talking about two, we're talking about two different policing aspects here. That, and I tell people that all the time. I said, you know, me, the police get behind me to have, I don't even have any hair on the back of my neck and it raises up. So what I'm saying to you is because I'm like wondering what are they gonna do? And, and, and I know when I came out of the academy, matter of fact, I remember an incident very clearly where I had my, my shoulder, my shoulder holster on and I was driving after I had on a shirt and a tie and everything and I was in the, I was in the police vicinity area that over here where the uh, municipal center is. The police came and surrounded my vehicle, jumped out, guns aiming and everything. I mean, I kind of freaked a little bit. I had to just put my hands up and I just froze. And they said, and once they came up and saw I was U.S. Marshal, they said, well, we had to report man with a gun. Black man with a gun. So what I'm saying to you is this. There are, to tell, a, to tell somebody, an African-American, you, you handle it this way, you, you, you cordial to the cops and everything else. If that officer is looking for arrest or he wants to harass somebody or he wants to create a scene, he's going to be looking to do that. And if he's out there and he's going to say something to you, that body camera may help you there. It may, if it's be, everything is being recorded. But we know they can turn them off. We know it's all types of things they can do. And then we're talking about cops out here in rural America and certain areas they tell you don't go through. I'm just saying there's a lot of things that still we need to address with judges, 
Lois, we got to address the system and say race is really a part of still America. It is as much as race is part of America's improprieties as apple pie. And we need to address that. A lot of times we try to pretend like it is a great thing, and it's not. It is really cut and dry. What's happening in that black community is a little different in that white community when it comes down to policing. It's a lot different. So I could sit here and tell probably most of the folks in this room, yeah, you know, you could say to them, because I knew, we knew, if I stopped a vehicle with four whites in the car and I stopped a vehicle with four blacks in the car, I knew whatever I said those black folks did, that whole institution was going to back me up. Prosecutor and all. Lock, stock, and barrel. Those four white folks, somebody might say, hey, Fargo, what was your probable cause? Never asked me that before. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? It's the culture, the culture that we, when the guy said, again, I, I want to emphasize that, this is how we do it here. When he said that to me, he wanted me to understand. I know you know the rules because you went through the academy. Don't worry about all that. If you got to shoot them, and, and when they talk about having a throwaway weapon, that was a part of the culture. Always make sure you got an extra weapon on you, a knife or something, just in case you get into an incident where you know you were wrong. Throw that knife on the ground. Put that knife in the hand, whatever. I mean, these, this is real, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I hope I'm not frightening anyone here, but this is real when I'm talking about things that are said on the inside and the culture that exists on the inside. So when we're thinking about these uh, potential cultural problems inside uh, police departments, Will on-body cameras actually have a real effect, or are they going to be running into the exact same issues we're seeing with uh, the dashboard cameras with them getting turned off or uh, the videotape going missing, similar issues? I think that um, I think that the technology is there where it can be it's obvious whether it was turned on or off or not. When you, you can look at the metadata, you know, with the, with the recording, you could tell whether it, a person turned it off or not, or whether it was uh, a, a technical failure. Certainly, a technical failure could include an officer snapping the camera, but that could be something that could be diagnosed uh, pretty easily afterwards. And I think that I'm, I'm a hopeful, I'm hopeful, and I'm, I'm optimistic, because I, I believe that we are, I hope that we are not going to see, or it will be very few and far between, where we have an incident like what happened in Ferguson, where, where someone dies as a result of, of a police officer, and we do not have video evidence of it whatsoever. I think that, that the technology is there. Certainly, when Ferguson you know, happened, the first thought I had and a lot of people had was, Where's the dash cam footage? There's no dash cam footage, and now you have uh, Ferguson police in Bearcats and military equipment, hundred you know, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the the full uh, uh, camouflage um, and and you know infrared goggles. And you're telling me they didn't have the technology and means to install uh, a dash cam in each car. Moreover, I think that if you have a situation where there were dash cams installed, and even body cameras, and both the dash cam and the body camera, for example, give out for one reason or another before um, a terrible, tragic incident, regardless of who is to blame, that if that technology goes out, that it will look a lot like obstruction of justice and will not be something that will be able to be looked uh, where the police and prosecutors will be able to look the other way, but rather would be investigating that in and of itself um, as a crime. I'm hopeful of that. I, I was recently at an event at the Urban Institute uh, with uh, DC Police Chief Kathy Lanier, among other people, and she was talking about the other technological ways that we that we can start bringing, uh, you know, police actions more in line with. with with respect to our rights. And one of the programs she's uh, thinking about is uh, tracking uh, basically who, who police pe pull over. Because it's not so much that we're dealing with, I mean, it, 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 we are dealing with it, but uh, many, many times it's like an officer doesn't think he's racist. He doesn't think that he's like, oh, I'm out there to try and you know, mess up these people because I don't like them. 
it's implicit bias. And so they just happened to be pulling over this, like an overwhelming amount of black people. And that, that measuring this and, when, and recording all of this and then being able to go back to this officer and say, hey, why are you only, you know, why are you only pulling over black people or mostly pulling over black people for, the, for these issues? And like having an accountability factor. I think this, along with the, with the body cams and this sort, of, this sort of profiling information within the police, within the police departments, is just part of a broader scheme of accountability. Um, uh, San Diego has a bunch of uh, body cam footage that they won't release. They're just like, it's not part of the public record. It was bought for with taxpayer dollars by people paid with tax money, but somehow it's not, you know, it, when you ask for like a Freedom of Information Act from them, they don't release it. You need a system that will actually become accountable for these people. And just to add a little bit more to that, um, once, and I, hate, I do this, I go back to race because I say when you're talking about race, it's almost like germ warfare. And I, when I say germ warfare in the sense that as soon as you come up with an antidote, they come back with a worse strand. And you begin to try to figure out every time you create a policy, accountability, it's really all about accountability. I mean, that's the bottom line. Like if officers are found to have violated someone's civil rights, then that officer should be held accountable, whether it is. I, I remember one day I'm on the radio, and we were talking about a road that was racial profile. The officer was stopping only the black speeders. So I had a black, a black man calls, and he goes, <clears throat> Mr. Fogg, he says, uh, were these people speeding? I said, yes, they were. He said, uh, and they were black? He said, he said, what's the problem? He said, they were speeding, weren't they? I said, I had to think about this one second. I said, well, you know, the problem is this we violated their civil rights first before we stopped them. I said, because we weren't stopping the white speeders. I said, so that was a violation of their civil rights because now we're stopping just them for that same crime. So the issue is, yes, on the job, a lot of officers may be doing things that they don't necessarily see as racist, as biased enforcement operations. They see it as going to the weakest link. That's what that particular manager told me, he said, look, if we go out there and we start arresting those folks out there, they know judge and lawyer, they're going to they gonna create a problem for us. So let's just simply go after the weakest link. Now, he was a white person telling me this. It never dawned on him that that weakest link for me was the community that I came from. It never, he never thought about that. He just said, look, they're all, they still violating the law. They're still using illegal drugs and so forth. With that same policy. So if we use the body cameras, going back to what um, um, Kat said about the body cameras, again, <clears throat> there's always ways you can mutate around what I did in my head as opposed to what I did physical. Because again, if I can convince you a jury, and we find that jurors just don't want to convict cops. And especially if the person happens to be African-American, somebody that most of the time the jurors can't even identify with. We, the jurors should look like the people who they're going to lock up, who they're going to put away. The community should be, the officers should look like the community they serve. That wasn't in Ferguson. So again, I'm saying you, we can bring up body cameras. These are all good things. We can put in policy when to use that taser, when to shoot, when not to shoot. But ultimately, it is on me, and I have to say, I have to be able to articulate, I felt threatened for my life. I got in a shooting in Miami. I didn't shoot him. My partner shot him. I never get this. I'm fighting this guy in the apartment. He was a escaped felon. We physically fighting all over his apartment. I got a nine millimeter on me. I'm fighting this guy from one room to the next. I'm so tired. To my arms became, I felt like Gumby when it was all over. <laughs> There was no strength in my arms. But here it is. And when it was all over, the guy still got out into the hallway, and my partner chased him, fell down with the shotgun, and boom. Didn't kill him. Just, as a matter of fact, the pellets didn't even hit, just didn't hit no vital areas. But ultimately, the, the U.S. attorney, I never get it. He sat down with me, and he said, Fogg, he said, I got one question for you. He said, when you was fighting this man in the apartment, he said, why didn't you just pull your gun out and shoot him? And I stopped. And I looked at him and I said, well, I guess I didn't feel like my life was in danger. He said, good answer, good answer.
And I guess that really was it because I'm fighting him. I never thought. Now, of course, they don't want us fighting people. And then he gets a good lick on me, knock me dizzy, and take my gun and then shoot me in the forehead or something. Then people say, well, why didn't the officers shoot him? He wasn't armed at that time. So, no, it's a lot of discretion. That's the point I'm making to you. When do I shoot? When do I fire? But we just happen to find that a lot of these incidents are taking place on the African-American community. That's what we're finding. So there is a mindset out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've just got one more question. I'm going to take the moderators on prerogative on before we go to our audience here. Anytime we start talking about cameras, you're obviously going to run into issues of privacy. And I think with the on-body cameras, um, I at least have been seeing two different facets of that argument. One of which comes from the police officers who are concerned about having their day-to-day -day, um, on the job filmed, um, not because they're worried about being caught in police misconduct issues, but because they're worried that they'll be filmed bad-mouthing their boss or something similar, um, and will then get um, in trouble because of that. On the other hand, I'm hearing from um, private citizens who are concerned that police wearing on body cameras might come into their homes for any number of routine reasons. That then turns their home uh, into potentially a public domain. Uh, what wouldn't normally be allowed to be filmed is now being filmed and they're concerned about, I think, uh, Fourth Amendment issues there. Could you guys speak a little bit to that? I think so. Um, I remember when, even before anyone had, had a smartphone, you know, the big issue was, um, cameras placed in, in public, you know, closed circuit cameras. And, and a lot of civil libertarians, myself included, were concerned that, you know, this smacks of George Orwell, 1984, you know, surveillance <laughs> state right. stuff. And, but, you know, they got installed despite objections and everyone just sort of waited for the other shoe to drop. But the thing is, most, I think people appreciate that when you are in public, you do not have an expectation of privacy. And police are now learning that they, too, do not have an expectation of privacy in public. So I think the concern that the police officers bad-mouthing their cops, I mean, that is barely hardly a justifiable reason to get rid of a technology that could reduce the, the you know, uh, horrible uh, instances of, of police misconduct or rather police covering it up. So there's, there's that. But I think the, the idea, and in fact, it's funny because it's almost always police departments, police unions in particular, who, who use the argument of, oh, we're concerned about people's privacy in their own homes if there's, another, if there's a police officer with a camera in their homes. This is something that so easily protocols can be developed that basically say, if you leak information, if you leak a video inside of people's homes to the public, that you'll be fired for that. And this information would only ever be used if it is relevant as far as the criminal case is concerned. Same with uh, the video of just, you know, the police officers always having the cameras on. There's, you know, the, 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 the video would only, the procedure would be, the video would only be pulled if there was a shooting or if there was an incident or, or even an arrest happening. And so I think we can craft policies and protocols that can easily uh, address these sorts of policy concerns or privacy concerns rather. Uh, I, I would agree with that, although I would prefer a legislation over uh, over protocols. I mean, you had the uh, Crime Act. Uh, it, this is in Radley Balco's book, Rise of the Warrior Cop. Uh, the, Sam Irvin, Senator Sam Irvin, uh, stopped uh, a bill that would have authorized uh, no-knock raids uh, from becoming federal policy. You just can't just bust down a door just because you're serving a warrant. <laughs> well, that legislation was blocked, but as all of us know, it is policy because there's no legislating legislation preventing it. So I would prefer instead of leaving it up to the police to develop the proper protocols to just to uh, you know to purge the to uh, purge the information when it's no longer relevant. I, I think we need some legislation to back this up. Um, and again, being in law enforcement and having been out in all types of operations. Uh, just thinking that a camera's on me would be, you know, I, I'd have to get a, a feel for it, get used to it. But, but let me say this, the reason why I think it's important that it is there. We, there's a show that comes on called Cops. I don't know how many people have seen Cops. I mean, they video everything. I mean, right? Y'all, I mean, they, they let these guys come in and video them in the car and ride, and they ain't enjoying it. 
and all this. If you can put it on cops, you can put it on your chest. That's what I'm saying to you. And, and my bottom line is, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is once the police comes to the scene anyway, there's no more privacy at that point. If I'm there on the scene, something's going on, the reason why I'm there, and we need to have some, some dialogue, there has to be something going on. So I think the cameras are important. I, I, I do agree with that. The body cameras need to be there. Some type of recording of what's being said and what's being done needs to be there. And it will make a lot of officers think twice about whether I'm telling somebody something that I know isn't legally proper or isn't right and whether I'm giving them their rights in that. But again, we said we've always known that people had rights and officers know that. And we've always been trained that way in the academy. We had all of the training. Somebody says, well, they need some more training. No, he doesn't. He needs to be fired. doesn't need any more training. We've gotten more training than, I don't want to say Carter got liver pills because I'm probably nobody in here will recognize that. They're so old. But, but, but the point is we've got all of this training, so we understand. We need to realize that, yes, this, the culture has gotten to such a way that America does need to see what you do. And you shouldn't have a problem with us seeing what you do because it, that's your job. Your job is to serve and protect the public, and the public should know exactly what you're doing. And we can make a call. And then we've got to start taking this, the, the accountability out of the policeman's hands and put it into a private, you know, private organization. Citizens Review Boards has got teeth. Something other than the police determining whether or not they messed up or not. 